Joel. Nice to see you again. Lovely to see you. When did we last spoke? Or when did we, when did we last speak? Was it a year ago? More than that? I think it was, yes. Yes. I think it was a year ago. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, I heard that there are exciting things happening in your world. More books, more writing. Mm-hmm. 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 Yep. Yep. Uh, of course, we'll be talking about co-creating safety today. And I have a, another book that's coming out next spring. It's a skill building book. It's called Healing Through Relating. Mm. And uh, it's got, it's a skill building book. It has the 42 most important skills, or at least I think our most important skills to, to just develop a therapeutic alliance. And they're designed really to work with any therapist, no matter what your, your background is, because every patient has to be able to declare a problem. Every patient has to, we have to regulate patient's anxiety and make it a safe place. And we have to find out if those patients will to work on the problem. And then no matter what kind of therapy you do, you need to be able to pick up on clues that there's a misalliance. So it just deals with basic skills everybody needs, regardless of what their theoretical perspective is. Mm. Well, that's exciting. Would yep. you be happy to talk about that in a later day as well? Oh, absolutely. Be delighted to. Mm. And I feel like all your books kind of, they complement each other. So mm. I think I'm sure we will also talk about some of those skills that are useful for every therapist and coach, which is mm -hmm. the therapeutic alliance and picking up signs when things are misaligned. So I'm sure we'll talk about that as well today. Absolutely. So let's dive in. Your book um, focuses on a group of clients that you call fragile clients. Mm -hmm. So maybe, okay, maybe tell us a bit more about the genesis of this book. How did it come about? And why have you chosen to focus on this topic? Well, um, a, a big reason I wrote the book was when I started out as a therapist, I oftentimes was bringing patients to a supervision that my teachers and supervisors were saying weren't treatable. This patient's not suitable for psychotherapy, they would say. Mm. This patient's not treatable. But the problem is these patients were coming to me. They were coming to this clinic. They were suffering psychologically and they mm. needed some help. Later on, fortunately, I found some supervisors who had skills in working with these patients. They had worked at hospitals. They had worked with severely troubled people. And, and, and the thing was, is that these people were great clinicians mm -hmm. and they were great teachers, but they had no interest in writing. Mm -hmm. And in this tradition that they represented, which came out of a place called Chestnut Lodge, it was a famous hospital outside of Washington, D.C. Many people came out of that tradition of how to work with civilly to serve people, but they wrote hardly any books that came mm -hmm. out of that tradition. So these are people who had worked with Harry Steck Sullivan, uh, Frieda mm -hmm. from Reichman, uh, Harold Searles, and others. Mm -hmm. But there was a whole way of working with these people that had been uh, missed. And, and so then, um, then as I uh, was, you know, of course, I do this model of therapy. It's called guy, uh, Habib Davenlu created this uh, model of uh, ISTDP, actually. Um, but he had this term, fragility, and this, this term and the group of people was, um, was an area of psychotherapy that, although he labeled it, he didn't really develop it. Mm. So it occurred to me it was really important for us to have a book that would really help people understand this mm. group of people as a whole and to understand them as a spectrum. Mm. Uh, so... So the term fragile, what it means is it's, it refers to a group of people where their anxiety oftentimes floods them, overwhelms them. Maybe they were, where they have stomach problems or they have diarrhea because their anxiety goes into the smooth muscles that line the stomach or line the digestive system or line blood vessels. These are patients who oftentimes get migraines oh. or they might... They might get, uh, they might become dizzy or they get blurry vision or ringing mm. in the ear. And, and these are signs of very severe anxiety that most therapists uh, don't pick up on. So these patients oftentimes go through many therapies where yeah. no one has ever noticed that they're really suffering from unbearable anxiety that would make it impossible for them to feel safe um, with a therapist. And in nature, because I, I mean, I just came out of migraine today, and mm -hmm. I also work with very sensitive people who 
sport have a lot of bodily symptoms and they're certainly a lot of them are hyper aware hyper anxious but um my question would be is that an innate thing or is it usually because they've been through some kind of trauma and it's a reaction um well of course we we know that there's such a thing as temperament mm. right so, you know e james anthony had this lovely metaphor he talked about in his research with children at the National Institute of Mental Health, he found that, you know, he said, you have steel children, you know, you drop the child and it doesn't seem to be affected at all. Yeah. You have another group that he called the rubber children. You brought, dropped them, they, they absorb the shock of the yeah. experience, they bounce back. Yeah. And then he talked about the glass children that when you drop them, they shatter. Yeah. So I think there's no question that there's an element of temperament that's yeah. that's involved. And that's an area that tends not to be looked at, but there's clearly an issue of temperament and anyone who's had kids can tell how their yeah. kids varied in temperament. And there's so, another concept for the dandelion children. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so then, but then oftentimes we do find that people that are suffering from her, very high anxiety, mm -hmm. there's some kind of trauma in the back, background, maybe like verbal abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, or maybe a very misattuned pair of parents who couldn't uh, couldn't handle the child's anxiety, couldn't regulate it. And so as a result, that child's anxiety mm. as a way, since it never gets regulated and comes back to homeostasis, after a number of failed encounters, the child's anxiety actually remains permanently elevated, which is called allostasis. So there are some people where their anxiety is constantly at, at, a, at a very high level. Mm. So they don't even know what it's like to feel calm. Mm. They're, they're constantly anxious. And so when, when people are suffering severe anxiety, then in this model, we're curious, where is their anxiety discharged in, in the body? If it's, if it's discharged in the somatic nervous system, then people will tense up, they'll feel tense, they'll sign, you'll see their hands clench and, and things like this. Mm -hmm. But what happens uh, when patients have suffered, you know, are suffering very high anxiety, their anxiety starts to move into what we call the parasympathetic nervous system. And when it goes in the parasympathetic nervous system, several things happen. Um, heart rate drops, pulse rate drops, blood pressure drops, and neurohormones are released in the brain so that they have trouble thinking. They have trouble remembering things. It's, and it's not, they're, they're not trying to be difficult. It's just when they're that anxious, the, the neurohormones mm -hmm. actually inhibit the, the functioning prefrontal cortex. Mm -hmm. And these are patients where they may not remember the session because the neurohormones shut down the hippocampus, which is where short-term memory gets stored for mm -hmm. long-term memory. Mm -hmm. So these are people, like I said, they'll, they'll have right stomach symptoms digestive symptoms irritable bowel syndrome crohn's disease they'll have um blurry vision difficulties thinking that sort of thing and i'm guessing they're disconnected from the trigger so they might say i That's don't right. know why i just woke up like that what happened exactly. i don't know they, nothing they don't happened know <laughs> No, and nothing did. It's just permanently elevated. And that's why we have to kind of work on regulating their anxiety mm -hmm. and also monitoring how are they feeling with the therapist? Because mm -hmm. their history usually is if I ask for help, I get hurt. Yeah. So when the patient comes for help, the body will react as if they're in danger. Mm -hmm. The patient will know, okay, I'm coming to see John or I'm coming to see Amy. The brain gets that, but the body will react as if they're in danger. And I guess that can explain why a lot of people stay for a few sessions and then they leave. I remember when I was a younger um, therapist, I used to feel very hurt by that. And then I go to my own therapist and say, oh, I don't know what's going on. I thought we had a good thing going. I thought there is a good rapport. What happened? And yeah, obviously, sometimes something might have, quote unquote, gone wrong, or maybe mm -hmm. I've said something that upset them. But sometimes it might just be that it's too good. That's right. Well, remember, if a patient has a good experience, it's 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 going to trigger such a contrast to what they experienced before. But the feelings about that prior con uh, that that prior experience come in, and that combination of the good experience with you and the memory of bad experience triggers so much feeling anxiety that the patient can't bear it. Yeah. This is like if you're with a, a paranoid patient, the worst thing you can do is be really warm. It's going to mm -hmm. scare that paranoid patient. 
he won't be able to handle it. Mm -hmm. Coming back to anxiety, I wanted to mention that when anxiety goes into the parasympathetic nervous system chronically, then people are going to have a lot of, um, they're going to have a lot of inflammatory uh, difficulties. Um, it's going to, if they have, uh, for instance, if they have um, any kind of inflammatory issues, I'm trying to remember, it's not lupus I'm thinking of, but MS, multiple sclerosis, mm. right? Patient that, that'll trigger. One of those wastebasket diagnosis that the Western yes. medicine can't right. so figure a lot out. Of so a lot of these people who have many somatizing issues, right, it's it's related to anxiety. And so that's why another reason why it's so important to be identifying that anxiety and regulating anxiety in the first session, because our first job is, you know, patient wants help, but their body reacts as if they're in danger. So the first task is, can we regulate their anxiety so it can feel safe to do therapy? Wow. So, I want right, to hear we, how, but... Yeah, because because if the patient's anxiety is too high, they, they literally can't can't bear it. So I, how I remember... do you catch it and kind of because it's so counterintuitive, isn't it? A lot of people go into these professions are naturally really warm and they want to build a connection, but yeah, it triggers the relational anxiety because they had yeah. such bad experiences in the past. Yeah. So how yeah. do we yeah. catch? not cash, but um, help them feel safe before they quit? <laughs> That's the key question, isn't it? Well, one of the things is to pay really close attention to how they respond. So yeah. we'll often ask, you know, what's the problem you'd like me to help you with? And uh, well, here, can the patient describe their problem in a calm way? Can they describe it in an articulate way? Or does but the patient... If they describe it in a calm and articulate way, can't we also argue that that's disconnection? Well, if they can detach, that's uh, that's actually really positive because that means they have access to intellectualization mm. uh, and, and detachment, which would mean they can isolate affect. That's a very high level of defensive capacity. That's a really good thing. The that's interesting the friend, because I would know a lot of therapists would challenge, include myself, including myself sometimes, would challenge that as over intellectualizing and being disconnected. Where you see very common is that hey, when you talk about your trauma, it's almost mm -hmm. as though you're talking about someone else's story. And right. my education told me that that's not usually a very good thing. So that's interesting mm -hmm. perspective. Right. Because if someone is really detached, yeah, we don't really have to worry about their anxiety. If they're really detached, they worry can, about something else. Right. They can detach from feelings, they detach from people. So their problem actually is they, they're not in touch with their feelings and they detach from people, they detach from life. So life doesn't seem that meaningful. Exactly. But that means, though, that they're in this resistance system we call isolation of affect, yeah. where the feeling word is isolated from the experience mm -hmm. of the feeling. Mm -hmm. Now that means their anxiety is, is in the somatic nervous system. They tend to tense up and sigh. I'm not worried about a patient like that. Interesting. Where I, where I get worried is if a patient starts to tell, uh, tell you know, I asked what's the problem you like me to help you with. At that moment, I'm watching, how does she respond? Like, when you say the, worried, what do you mean? Well, if I ask, what's the problem you like me to help you with? If the patient is in a high level, uh, is has high capacity, she might sigh. She might say, well, I've got some problems with my husband. Mm -hmm. Now that sigh lets me know her anxiety is in the somatic nervous system. That lets me know, okay, this is a high capacity patient. But lo let's suppose the patient starts to tell a problem and there's no sigh. Now I'm on the alert. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, is her anxiety going into the smooth muscles or is it going into cognitive perceptual disruption where she has trouble thinking? So I'll listen carefully. As she's talking, is she able to talk, uh, talk in, in a way that makes sense? Is it calm? Or does her speech start to race? Yeah. If her speech is racing, ah, that's They're a sign of time. Yeah. So I might just say, uh, thank you so much. I notice you're talking rapidly right now, and that can be a sign of anxiety. Are you aware of feeling anxiety right now? So I'll talk slowly to slow her down. Mm -hmm. And then I'll say, um, where are you aware of feeling anxious right now? You directly ask them to breathe. You say, for God's sake. 
Uh, not necessarily. I, I first, I first want to find out where their anxiety is discharged, right? I want to know, are they having stomach problems? Do they have digestive problems? Are they dizzy? Are, how is their vision? How is their hearing? I want to check right away to mm -hmm. see, because this is a way for the, the patient to learn about anxiety symptoms. And it's a way that, that I'm helping her with her anxiety. Mm -hmm. So rather than stopping them, you actually help them become aware so they would modulate it themselves. That's right. And I see how they're responding to that. Now, in the course, this may make the patient even more anxious because I'm helping her with her anxiety, right? Mm -hmm. So we're just noticing as I help you uh, with your anxiety, that, that triggers anxiety too. And what's that like for us to notice? Mm -hmm. Right. So in a way, so we're just seeing something about coming here for help makes you anxious and you have these symptoms. So now you're making sense of the session for the patient. So something about wanting some help, triggers some anxiety, and then we notice these symptoms. So you're helping the patient begin to reflect on what's happening now, mm -hmm. to observe what's happening now. Mm -hmm. So she understands this process. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes that's enough. Um, some sometimes yeah you may have to help a patient with slow breathing sometimes you may uh, invite a patient to push her hands together like this that will increase uh, blood pressure uh, that'll boost the sympathetic nervous system so that the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems become balanced now as you continue to work with the anxiety you're also going to be listening for hints and maybe the patient says i'm just afraid of the questions you want to ask now you realize, oh, this patient is not only anxious, but she's letting me know she's anxious because she's afraid I am going to make her do something she doesn't want to do. So now I know, oh, she's projecting on me and I need to deactivate that projection. Otherwise, she's going to continually be afraid of someone who's going to do something to her against her will. Mm. Now, of course, that's the history of trauma right there, isn't it? Yes, it is. But that, that means that's a beautiful opening. We don't talk about the past, but we'll deactivate the projection on the therapist and say, well, thank you for letting me know. Mm -hmm. First of all, I have no right to ask you any questions that you don't want to answer. Mm -hmm. That's why we need to find out what questions you want answered here in therapy so you can get the help you want for you. So just to check in, was it your will to come? I noticed that you're speaking much slower too. And then That's you're helping right. them tap into their own will, which yep. I'm imagining it's a part of their ambivalence. Right. Well, you know, the you know, people people who've been traumatized have learned I shouldn't express my will. I'm supposed to submit to the will of the abuser. And like, suppose a patient has received physical abuse. If I express my will, I've learned I get beaten. So for these patients to express their will, their whole body will, will just respond with tremendous anxiety right away. Mm -hmm. So we have to help her knowledge that, that it was, was it your will to come here today? And are you wanting me to help you? And are you wanting some help to overcome your difficulties? When I can remind the patient of her will, and she can own it inside, then she doesn't have to project it outside onto me, where then she'd be afraid of my will. So when she projects that onto me, I have to help her own her will inside, and then she's going to feel safer inside with her will. And we're building her capacity to own her will, and we're also internally getting a sense, wow, it was I really- I could imagine people could be really far gone in the projection and be completely disappointed dissociated from their own will and desire and intention i don't know mm -hmm. why i'm here you want me to be here my husband wants me to be here actually keep in mind that that that, that although your your husband wanted you to be here this really can't be his treatment mm -hmm. and since these aren't my problems i actually don't need you to work on that so but you they... remind the people real just hang on this is a way that you remind the patient of reality you know mm -hmm. this can't be your husband's therapy since these aren't my problems right i actually don't need you to work on anything you're reminding her of reality and then follow up that's why we have to find out what 
you want to work on that you think would be helpful for you. In response, there will be a number of defenses, of course, and we will just address them one by one as we're very gradually helping the patient own her wish to be there and deactivate her projection. Let's suppose, uh, I, I don't know why I'm here. Uh-huh, uh-huh, and yet, so you don't know why you're here, and at the same time, you came. Mm -hmm. And we're just noticing this confusing reality. Don't know why you're here, and you came, and just noticing that complexity here mm. today. There, you're doing the pressure to consciousness of splitting, right? I don't know why I'm here, uh, you know, uh, uh, so we're, we're just noticing she doesn't know why she's here, and yet she's here. So we remind her of these contradictory realities. That's splitting. How people understand why have we split off our own? I mean, we split a lot of things off, our own will, our feelings. But when it mm -hmm. comes to will, it does, I mean, intuitively, we understand why we, well, actually, we don't, we may need more explanation. But I think a lot of sure. people understand the idea of projection. And we might have mm -hmm. talked about projective identification last time. If we don't, we can mm -hmm. come back to it. But I think people have an understanding of how we want to split off feelings because it's painful. We don't want to tolerate like liking and hating someone at the same time. We don't want to tolerate these things. But the mm -hmm. will, why would we split off from our will? It's such a beautiful, life-giving thing. Well, because imagine the child who's uh, being sexually <laughs> abused, yeah. right? she has to split off her will, yeah. right? The abuser, abuser says, split off your will and submit to mine. Yeah. The, the, the parent who beats a child, split off your will and submit to this beating, yeah. right? So in a way, right, you know, this is the kind of parent who says, uh, if you don't like it here, there's the door. Right. So like if I have my complex complexity, I have to take myself out of the house. If I stay in the house, I have to leave my will outside the house. Right. So in essence, the parent is teaching the child how to split. If you want to be in this house, you have to split off and deny that part of your experience. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, you see every defense in a way is is in a way telling us the history. And I guess what they have learned and internalized is having any desires, intents of their own purpose. Yep. It's dangerous. It, yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's all getting reworked with us. So they, you know, therapy starts with I want help. Therapy starts with the wish to depend and will. Mm -hmm. And for your most fragile patients, that is that is proven to, you know, depending got me hurt, expressing my will got me hurt. So we're never surprised that when they come to depend they're going to flood with anxiety. They know, okay, it's John. They know it's Amy, mm -hmm. but their body is going to have this reaction because it's, uh, you know, even if you think in terms of uh, behavioral therapy, right? It's a conditioned response. Yeah, yeah. So it's sort yeah. of like the, like I'll say to patients, right? Because you know you're with John, uh, but your body is reacting as if you're with someone else. Mm -hmm. You know, you know you're, in this office here at 3000 Connecticut, but your body is reacting as if you're somewhere down in South Carolina. Mm. Yeah. Mm. You know, in this way to help the, the patient understand how they can be cognitively aware of John, but the, that they do have a genuine bodily emotional response that seems so different and it's not their fault. It's just, it's just the history of the past coming up to be heard and understood. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. That's very clean. Mm -hmm. And I do want to circle back into our original point of people's fear of dependency. I want mm -hmm. to read out a quote from your book, and then maybe we can mm -hmm. use that as a starting point. Yeah. Let me see. Okay. She requires, this is a quote from your book. She requires therapy, yet relying on a therapist conjures up her history of depending. Most mm -hmm. fragile patients learn to love while enduring many traumas. So that's mm -hmm. interesting. Learn to love while enduring trauma. People they trusted abandoned, hurt, or abused them. Depending caused pain, not pleasure. No wonder mm -hmm. they feel fear when they seek safety. Through mm -hmm. safety, the body signaled that depending was not safe. It was dangerous. Mm -hmm. Anxiety tells us the history of their suffering. Now, mm -hmm. I want you to expand on that. And I want to ask you a question about 
its correlation to attachment styles because mm -hmm. a lot of things you're describing sounds a lot like anxious and disorganized attachment but mm -hmm. yeah I, I want to hear more sure sure because the basic point is the patient has learned that depending if i depend i'll get hurt mm -hmm. so on the one hand the patient comes to you for help because on a conscious adult level she understands you're a helper but she will have this unconscious bodily response as if she's going to be hurt by you so both these reactions are happening and we're having to help the patient handle uh, handle this this mixed reaction of wanting help and fearing being hurt, mm -hmm. and that will come up in the form of anxiety. Mm -hmm. Patient mm -hmm. comes in, sit, sits down, and says, "I don't want to be here." Uh huh. Uh huh. Being here and not wanting to be here. Being here and not wanting to be here. And what's it like to just notice that that complexity coming up here today? Mm -hmm. Right mm -hmm. there, I'm helping the the patient with with these split apart urges being here not wanting to be here not wanting and of course we learned later he had a very physically abusive mother so being here not wanting to be here right as a child you, you you're wired to connect so you're wired to connect but what if you're wired to connect to someone who who's beating you right it's it's going to be this mixed reaction Mm -hmm. So yeah, being here, not wanting to be here, being here, not wanting to be here. And then he got dizzy because mm -hmm. the mixed things were coming together. And so something about being here, not wanting to be here, something about that makes you dizzy. And, mm -hmm. and can we just notice this, this complexity coming up as we're just helping him bear this, these contradictory experiences he's having while he's here uh, with me in, in the room. Mm -hmm. Yes, that, that explains it. And articulates it more um uh, i wasn't articulating myself very well just now okay so i think people's very basic understanding of attachment style is in avoidant attachment you don't want you don't you push away right. in the anxious you go forward and you check in and you keep wanting you keep approaching so one is withdrawing and one is approaching um do you notice any correlation between fragile clients and attachment style i mean it doesn't have to be scientific maybe just in your observations i i haven't uh, obviously <clears throat> obviously the more troubled the patient the more likely it is that we'll see a disorganized attachment for example we see that and that's what the research is, is showing is that disorganized attachments are quite a bit more common in patients who've really been um really been severely abused that, that's gotcha. quite common yeah mm. sure mm. so yeah i want i'm always finding myself having to convince clients that there is such a thing as healthy dependency because i think the word dependency you call it dependence you call it dependency mm. in our very or well, american culture western culture very individualistic cultures the word dependency has such a negative connotation. So do you think there is such a thing as healthy dependency? And how can we help people to not fear depending or opening up or being vulnerable? Well, of course, of course, all of us depend upon one another. We, you know, we this interdependency. Uh, uh, interdependency. It's a web. We all depend on, on one another. So when the patient says, I don't think it's healthy to depend, yeah. um, I, 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 wouldn't, I would never argue with the patient. I'd say, there must be a really good reason you came up with that belief. Yeah. What, what's your experience that led you to have that belief? Because, you know, if someone's beating you, it's, yeah, it's kind of dangerous to depend on that person. Mm -hmm. um, dependency has led to her. Tell me more. Because mm -hmm. then we want to find out, yeah, why wasn't it a good idea to depend? Uh, who told them that they shouldn't depend? Where did they get the message that depending was unhealthy? Mm -hmm. Then instead of you convincing them, you can get curious about why this makes sense to them. Mm -hmm. why, why, this, why it was so adaptive not to depend. Because yeah. sometimes in a way, we have to help them see, wow, not depending was a, a saved your life. It Absolutely. sounds like not depending on this abusive father was, was really, it saved your life. And we should thank that five-year-old child for figuring out, I shouldn't depend 
on that father. Yeah. And so can we thank that five-year-old child for coming up with such an important life-saving solution? Yeah. And now today, would it make sense that we might want to figure out a way to handle these things mm -hmm. that with your 30 year old mind mm -hmm. that the five year old mind uh, couldn't couldn't find. Mm -hmm. Right. So in a way, oftentimes you have to validate why that makes perfect sense yeah. so that then we could take a look. And because in, in also another way, another way to deal with those pa patients is no, I, I don't want to depend on you. Uh-huh. Well, thanks for letting me know. So I wonder what feelings are coming up here toward me that, that make you want, want to not depend. Mm -hmm. Now, the patient doesn't want to depend on you. It's not because you're eeny. You represent someone in the past. So when they say, I don't want to depend on you, it could be, I don't want to depend on you, my mother. I don't want to depend on you, my father. I don't want to depend on you, my abusive uncle. So they say, uh-huh. So can we just see? Right. You don't want to depend on me. Okay. Mm -hmm. So as you let yourself not depend on me, what, what feelings are coming up here toward you? Yeah, can we see what feelings? Now the feelings can come up toward you that couldn't go toward that abuser in the past. You're really, you're really open. You're the patient's saying, I can't look at feelings directly toward them. Will you be sort of the proxy, the substitute where all these feelings come up? And then and then, and then eventually a patient may say, but, but you haven't done anything. I said, that's true. But can we just let me be the place where these feelings come up and then we'll find out later where they belong. Mm. So in a way, instead of a, trying to argue them out of position, we could just get really curious about it. And right, not wanting to depend on me, right? Well, given your past, that makes total sense. Right, so I wonder, insofar as you're not wanting to depend on me, what, what feelings do you know is coming up here toward me today? Mm. Mm. So it's yeah. a way not viewing a response like that as a problem, but really as a portal, a doorway. That's really good. See, but you're right. Like, I mean, right. I do that too, the empathizing and the looking mm -hmm. at the young warrior that was creatively yep. coming with all these creative strategies just to survive. Yep. So rather than try to convince a patient, I ask the patient, patient to tell me why that makes sense there exactly. must you know, it's like there must be a really good reason not to and not just as a child time. sometimes it's really quote-unquote rewarding to as a grown-up like let's say you're a surgeon or like you know you're a, a high mm. function a high fly in your career sometimes it's mm. very convenient to split our vulnerabilities right or 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 to say it's and it sounds like and it sounds like this uh this um yeah if you have a really highly functional person yes it's not and it sounds like not depending on on people yeah it makes you safe and calm absolutely uh but it sounds like it's also making you lonely yeah it's sort and of that's like their you're, will that's why they came to you in the first place yeah so it sounds like you're a king in a castle and and, and no one gets into the castle yeah. so yeah. It, it sounds like it makes you safe but it sounds like it's making you lonely mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and since and since you're putting up the castle wall here with me in this relationship, which you're saying it's nothing personal, this is what you do with everybody. This gives us a chance to see what gets stirred up with a person that would make you put up that wall here with me. So I wonder what feelings are coming up here toward me that make you put up the castle wall here. Yeah, what feelings are coming up here toward me? There's a psychoanalytic term that again sounds very negative, but I would like you to expand on it. Omnipotence is very much mm -hmm. related to what we're talking about. What do they mean in psychoanalysis when they say, I, I mean, in this context, it probably refers to the idea that we can fulfill all our needs. Right, right. Um, well, there's, there's, there's several ways we could look at that. I mean, I, I think uh, everybody who's listening has probably had a highly resistant patient pretty highly functional person. They're detached in their marriage. If they have one, they're detached in all their relationships. They're detached with you. And you find, and the, and, the, and the person's kind of just sitting back and waiting for you to do your job. And you keep working, but they keep taking kind of a passive stance, kind of waiting for you to kind of make something happen here. And in that sense, when a patient takes kind of a passive stance, you find yourself becoming a little bit more active. You find yourself talking more. And oftentimes, you know, when I'm working with a student, I say, so um, how, many, how many sentences did you just say? And they'll say five. And, and how many sentences did the patient say? 
Well, he just made a noise. He just went. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I said, okay, so the, could we say that this patient's taking a passive stance? Right. And then who is he expecting to do all the work here? Mm. Right. And I said, so what we have here is ordinarily in a relationship, you give 100%, patient gives 100%, mm -hmm. we'll have the best result we can have. Mm -hmm. But we're noticing this guy is giving 0%. Mm -hmm. He wants you to give your 100%. And he's asking you to give his 100% too that he's withholding from the therapy. Mm. So it's as if you're asked to be an omnipotent therapist. You're asked to do, to do your work and his work, which he's withholding. So it's as if you're supposed to be an omnipotent therapist who could do the work of two people. Where did that come from? Well, this is um, this was something Freud began to realize is that a patient may have a wish that you'd be an omnipotent therapist and that they could just sit back and let the therapy do its thing while they could just kind of passively wait for you to do all the work. Is there a childhood desire for a strong per parent figure? Um, well, or it can be, uh, or it can be a way that a, a, maybe a patient is enacting an, an how he went passive uh, with a father or a mother, or uh, maybe he's yeah. acting how a parent or mother went passive with him, mm -hmm. where he kept wanting something with him, but they were too passive and just weren't able to give it to him. So That's he so might be withholding from you the way a parent withheld from him. Mm, interesting. So that you're supposed to somehow, yeah, make it, make it all happen. Mm, yeah. Thank you. Or, for instance, a patient might say, well, uh, I, I'm just helpless. I don't know what I feel. Right. So I'm helpless. You've got to do the work. I don't know what I feel. So you must tell me what I feel. You, in fact, must feel my feelings for me. Right. That would be in another. Um, yeah. Well, since I'm not you, I can't feel your feelings. Only you could do that. Mm. I think people do that even as ordinary people, we do that in our day-to-day -day very often, especially feelings we can't handle, like anger or shame. Mm -hmm. One classic example, I think, is people go home and then they tell their partner how abusive their manager and bosses are. But then when you ask them how they feel, they're like, no, it's all right. It's a job, isn't it? <laughs> and then everyone around them are all angry on their behalf. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned... Um, in your book, patients use three strategies for avoiding feelings. Mm -hmm. Number one, detaching from mixed feelings. Mm -hmm. Number two, turning anger onto the self whilst feeling love for others. And mm -hmm. number three, splitting mixed feelings apart and projecting onto others. You've talked about three just now. Mm -hmm. I'm very interested in number two because I have that a lot with a lot of my people clients where they turn anger onto themselves whilst everyone else is good i'm bad i'm bad i'm bad mm -hmm. mm. is that related right. to the fabian idea of in fabian i'm not pronouncing his name right internalized anger why because it's scary for a child to imagine their parents being imperfect so everything must be their fault or, or yes. do you conceptualize it differently Yes, yeah, so it, it can be it can be related very much to Fair Baron's idea, right? I preserve the mother is good or father is good, and then I'm all mm. bad. Then if I'm the one who's bad, there's still hope for a good relationship with a good, all good parent. Sure. Mm. Here, here we look at it in another way, which is that when the patient is with you and the patient has mixed feelings toward you, she may avoid the mixed feelings by saying, Oh, I love Eni, but I'm I must be your worst patient, or I'm a terrible person. So since the patient, we view that as a way a patient is protecting you, protecting a therapist she loves, if she goes to self-attack in session, we're thinking about it not just as a way she handles feelings in herself, we're thinking about her defense of self-attack as how does she regulate the relationship? Yeah. And, and how is she protecting me by turning anger on herself? So if the patient says, I, I'm just really all bad, I'd say, uh-huh, could that be critical thought? Could, is that the kind of critical thought that could make you depressed? Uh-huh. So can we see, yeah, what feelings are coming up here toward me? Or we might say, yeah, so if you don't hurt yourself and, and you don't protect me, can we see what feelings are coming toward me? Now, that's a big shock for the patient. Oh, my God, this is a therapy where I could actually feel anger toward another person outwardly? 
You mean you don't need to be protected? You don't need to be viewed as all good? You're not asking me to, to attack myself to maintain a relationship with you? I said, yeah, yeah, can we just see what, what feelings are coming up toward me? And that way you're really restructuring the attachment pattern right there just by asking, yeah, what feelings are coming up toward me? Now, could that be a way of protecting me? Yeah, so can we see what feelings are coming up here toward me? You said they love you more. That's their relational pattern. Well, remember, remember, as soon as soon as you have the phone call and you say, sure, we can meet at 10 o'clock on Wednesday, right? As soon as you have that phone call, you said, I've agreed to care for you. Mm. On the deepest level, I have already made the decision to be loving to you. Mm. That's really what it means. I, I don't know you at all, but I am on the base of my job. I'm already offering a loan of faith. I'm, I'm believing in you. I'm going to care for you. I'm going to try to help you. That's, that's an extension of love. So as soon as you, we, we, we forget, we just think, okay, I made an appointment at 10 o'clock on Tuesday. Duh, duh, duh. That's not what it means. It means I have offered to care for you. I've made a commitment to you. I have faith in you that stirs up the whole attachment system in the patient. That's why some patients come to you and they've already started projecting before they even met you because they couldn't handle the feelings inside and they had to send them outside. That's why some patients will be very anxious as soon as they sit down in the room with you. It's because of this offer. It's why some patients may already be going to self-attack because it stirred up all the memories of the past. They're already protecting you before they come to the room. So it's very important to realize when you make that call and you offer, make that offer of a time, that symbolizes the whole, uh, something very powerful. And it's, so their whole attachment gets stirred up. So the more trouble the patient, the more troubling the symptoms they'll have, but it's because of that call. Some may start projecting, some may get really anxious, some will go to self-attack as soon as they meet you. Others will just be kind of detached and totally distant, right? They, they, they don't have trouble with mixed feelings because they're so detached from those feelings. But that really helps you see a spectrum of response and it's all to your call. You've, you've offered to care for the patient. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. And so they already want to preserve the love, the care that is there. That's right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to project all these hostile feelings out of here, right? So that you don't get hurt. I'll turn them on myself or I may just be really anxious. Yeah. And that's why, wow, you seem really anxious. Can we help you with that anxiety? And once it's regulated, do you have any sense of what feelings are coming up here in the therapy that would trigger so much anxiety? Yeah. Any sense of what thoughts and ideas are coming up about, about the therapy that would trigger so much anxiety? And this is a way to kind of help them think about what this means for them and why it triggers so much anxiety so they can finally feel safe with you and be regulated with you so that it's finally safe to explore. Mm -hmm. In a way, it's sort of like uh, it's sort of like a burning house comes into your office and we have to kind of put the fire out first um, be before we work on the house or try to repair it. Mm. Yeah. How? Mm. So what do you do? What do you do when you have a client like that or patient like that? Well, the first thing we try to do is regulate anxiety and, and help them see the anxiety, help regulate anxiety. If we're not able to regulate anxiety within about five minutes, it means that they're usually projecting on them, onto us. So then we need to find out what they're projecting. So we might just ask, yeah, so what thoughts and ideas do you have about the, the therapy? And maybe they'll say things, I'm afraid of the questions you wanna ask. I'm just wondering where the therapy is going. W what are you wanting from me? Those are projections. So where's the therapy going to go? I would say, I don't know. Since this is not my therapy, I can't know where it's going to go. That's why I have to find out from you, where do you want the therapy to go? So it goes to a good place that would be good for you, right? I'm deactivating that projection. What are you wanting from me? Actually, I don't, don't want, want anything from you because this isn't my therapy. I'm just meeting with you to find out what you want from the therapy that you think would be helpful to you and, and give you the relief you're looking for. 
So again, it's picking up on those projections and deactivating them. Like in my book, Co-Creating Safety, you may remember that there's a chapter on will and all it is is like, what are all the different projections that come up? How do we deactivate those projections that come up in a very smooth way? So the patient doesn't have to be afraid of you and can own, oh yes, I want this therapy to go somewhere. Oh yes, I, I want to talk. Um, I think there's a case in there um, where a, a patient, it becomes clear a patient is afraid to talk about herself. And so I ask, so do you want to talk about you? And she got really anxious. And I said, oh. isn't that interesting? So something about wanting to talk about yourself makes you anxious as if it'd be against the law mm. for you to talk about yourself in your own thing. So let's just check in. Are you sure you want to talk about mm. yourself? You just really take care, right? Mm. But this is where if you can't regulate the anxiety, usually the patient is projecting something onto you. So then you're on the hunt mm. trying to find out what are the projections so you can deactivate the projections so the patient can finally feel safe with you. And that's where it can be really useful to say any, you know, what, what thoughts and ideas are you having about the therapy? And then oftentimes then from that question, you'll learn what they're projecting onto you and deactivate the projections so that instead of having a misalliance with the projection, they can finally have a, an alliance with you. Mm. If, if they have a misalliance with the projection, yes, they'll, they'll leave after a, a session or two. They won't be able to bear being in the room yeah. with their projection. Yeah, gotcha. Oh God, this is so rich. I love talking to you. Oh, you have I'm a so way funny. of explaining extremely complex relational concepts in a way that we can all understand. I want to be respectful of your time. So I think I might just ask one or two more key things. Sure. This is one thing I'm personally very curious about. How do you, because from your style, I think you are very analytical I, I i could be wrong but also very relational a lot in mm -hmm. your books it's a lot about using the space we have between us and that's the way i think about it as well not just mm -hmm. therapy but also coaching in any kind of encounter mm -hmm. but i get a lot of questions about what we actually do about steps and structures and worksheets and sometimes i find it really hard to explain the relational process, especially in our world of C of all these manualized steps, mm -hmm. um, short-term therapies. Yeah. And what I, would be a simple question that 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 you'd like help with? You mean me or yeah, because what, what's a question that a, a patient gives how you that do we oh, okay? Mm, so what do they ask me, for example? yeah oh, okay mm -hmm. so what are the steps what what are the steps what are the next steps or what mm -hmm. is the structure here do you have a set structure are there step-by-step mm -hmm. -step things that we do are you going to give me homework are there going to be worksheets mm -hmm. are there going to be instructions how does this mm -hmm. work sure. there'll be no uh, no worksheets uh some instructions sometimes but in terms of the next steps, it really, really depends on, on what you're able to face and what you're having trouble facing. It, it really will depend on your motivation and it'll depend on, on your ability to deal with what you usually avoid. In a good therapy, we're gonna help you face what you usually avoid. And so in terms of the steps, that really kind of depends on you, your motivation, and um, your ability to deal with what you usually avoid. So we're actually going to find out from your responses well, what the next steps will be. Oh, but that sounds really wooly. So there's nothing that you already said? Like, don't you have a process? Uh, there's no box I fit you into. That's correct. Are there going to be structures to the session? Uh, there's always a structure to the session, and it's provided by you and your responses. But I don't know what structure. I don't know what to do or say. I don't know. Oh, well, I always well, feel like well, I'll say the wrong thing. Ah, right. Well, there's a structure. Yeah. And this, if this fear you're going to say the wrong thing, could that be a form of self-doubt? Mm. Could that be a self-critical thought? Mm. 
and that and that internal structure of self doubt and self criticism is that an internal structure that you would like my help with? It sounds really vague. Uh huh. Uh huh. But the question is, but you notice you didn't answer my question. Do, do you want help with this tendency to self-doubt? Yes, absolutely. Uh -huh. So you see from your self-doubt, we've already learned what the structure is for this session, what we're going to be helping you with. That's true. So given that, could we consider the self-doubt a form of self-harm? Mm. And since you're harming yourself here in our relationship, naturally, I'm concerned about anything that would be coming up here that would make you harm yourself that way. So I wonder, if we look underneath your self-doubt, what, what feelings do you notice coming up here with me? And that would be a way that you would make the transition. So you're on the lookout for what defenses. Now, clearly, this person starts out with structure because they're afraid of what's coming up. They, they want some kind of control. But once we get to self-doubt, then you can work with that and, and begin your work. Mm -hmm. But in a sense, we're, the structure is actually provided by the patient because every response they have, every defense, that's telling us the internal structure that we're going to work with. The patient can't know that. So if patient says, how is this going to work? And you said, well, you'll, you'll find out through, the, through, through, through our work today. Mm -hmm. Through Thank the experience you. of our work today. Because... I, I haven't met you, I haven't had a chance to work with you. So of course, I can't know what kind of structure would be optimal for you yet. It's interesting, the parallel process here where I thought about some questions that I'll ask you, but then in the end, I just responded to what you said and spontaneously come up with things and trusted the process. Yeah, it's like that old saying, life is what happens while we make plans. <laughs> I love that quote. Yes. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for your time and for writing such a beautiful, practical, deep, um, intelligent book. Well, thank you so much. And for you listeners, we're talking about co-creating safety, healing the fragile patient. Yep. And for any of you that have patients suffering from high anxiety or patients in the borderline spectrum or, or even patients that have had hallucinations, this book will mm. go into great depth and how, uh, with a lot of practical advice on how to help those patients. Do you think so thank clients... you again. Thank, thank you. you again so much for inviting me. I'm very Do you think clients can benefit from it? if they find themselves having relational fears and yeah. feeling yeah. fragile in the way you define yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. I've known some patients that benefited from it. It was very informative for them, yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. Great. Thanks so much uh, Thank for you. this invitation and take care. Absolutely. Bye, -bye. Bye John. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Take care. Thank you. Speak soon.